Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Todd Hunter and the Honorable Blake Parenthal. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you for welcoming us to Corpus Christi, and so nice to see both of you again, good friends of the Tribune, and, and, and thanks so much for being here. Uh, Congressman Farrell, let me begin with you and ask uh, what the impact of the national election that we just went through, it seemed like it went on forever, finally it's over, but there is an impact to the outcome. What is the impact of the national election, of President Obama being reelected and of Congress being effectively status quo plus on Texas going Actually, forward? that's a really good question because I think what you've got is President Obama trying to spin the results of the election as an endorsement of uh, his policies. Uh, do it my way. You've got the Republican House saying, wait a minute, if it were a 100% endorsement of your policies, we wouldn't still be here as a majority uh, in the House. So I think it's really hard to come up with a read uh, other than I think our government is working as it was uh, intended, uh, a two-party system where you continue to have compromise. Uh, nobody gets uh, what they want, but hopefully uh, everybody can come up with something uh, that they can live with. Congressman, you say that we have a two-party system and that the result was compromised, but in fact, the response from a lot of people out in the country to the folks who were in charge the last four years and are going to be in charge again, at least for the next two, was that there wasn't enough compromise. There was too much gridlock. No seemed to be the preferred solution to a lot of problems as opposed to the kind of compromise that solves problems. Can you talk about that? Well, again, I think that uh, you know, had the American people wanted something like they had in the uh, previous Congress where the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and the White House, uh, you'd have seen a lot more losses in the, uh, uh, in the, in the House of Representatives. I think you saw an excellent uh, campaign by yep. the uh, Obama administration that uh, brought in a whole lot of new voters. The number of new voters was astoundingly high. Uh, I think you saw a lackluster turnout uh, of Republicans. I think they, the, uh, the Republicans were not happy with the Obama economy. Uh, they, they were not uh, as behind Mitt Romney as uh, Mitt Romney had hoped. Right. But, the, but the upshot is with the same folks, Republican-led House by a small margin, Democratic-led Senate by a small margin, and Democrat in the White House, it's not going to be appreciably different this time than it was last time. Well, I, I hope it is. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and uh, expect a different result. I, I, I think with, I hope with President Obama not facing uh, another election, he'll follow the model of uh, Bill Clinton and come to the center. I'm concerned some of the signals he's sent uh, have indicated he is not. We've already heard uh, from Speaker Boehner that increased revenues are uh, on the table, which they were not at all on the table uh, last time around. I, you know, I, I think there's some limits to that. A, a lot of uh, Republicans, like myself, uh, ran on a premise of not uh, raising the tax rates, but uh, I do think there's some areas for compromise on increased revenue. We can look at what uh, happened in the state. User fees were not considered a, a, a tax increase. Uh, tax reform would not be a tax rate increase. So, uh, you know, I you're, think you're open to these things. I, I think uh, we've telegraphed uh, to the administration and to the American public that, uh, that we're willing to work. That's good. Uh, Representative Hunter, uh, obviously we, we like to believe that what happens in Texas we control. We don't like the federal government particularly. I've lost count of how many lawsuits we have filed against the federal government. Uh, and the governor's position and the position of elected officials on down with regard to the federal government is widely known. But we are one of 50 states, at least for the time being, um, uh, until that petition is resolved. Uh, and so let me ask you, since we are going to have to be in some uh, contact with the federal government over the next couple of years, what do you think the impact of the election is likely to be on the way that we self-govern? Well, I don't think we're going to be on the president's Christmas card list this year. Right. And that won't be much of a change for the last couple of Christmases, right? Look, when it comes to the state of Texas, the state of Texas is an independent group. We are all different viewpoints, but Texas is going to stand up for Texas. And we don't really look at it as one versus 50 we look at it as what is best for the state. So if the federal government goes off on one rabbit trail, it doesn't mean that we're going to follow. And we're only there five months, hopefully, out of every two years. But I think the impact on the national election is going to be, I think, Texas state government is going to be focused more on itself, on a region and the state itself. Well, let me ask about one of those rabbit trails specifically, health care. We've heard a lot so far 
about health care as it relates to the National Election Affordable Care Act uh, determined as constitutional by the Roberts Court. President's re-election and the numbers in Congress mean that repeal is unlikely, if not, uh, 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 you know, definitely not going to happen. Uh, so we have an opportunity, Representative, here at the state level to avail ourselves of some of the aspects of the Affordable Care Act, expansion of Medicaid and the dollars that come along with that on a short-term basis, creating a state insurance exchange. Governor Perry has said he doesn't want to get involved with the Affordable Care Act, doesn't want to expand Medicaid, doesn't want to create a state insurance exchange. What are we likely to see happen in the next session if our stance against the federal government is we don't want to play with what is now certain to be the law of the nation? Well, you got to remember, it's not just Texas taking that position. There's a Indeed. lot of states. Yeah. Many, many other states. I think Governor Fallon of Oklahoma was the Absolutely. most recent last week to say that she was not going to do it either. Here's what I think is going to happen. It's a serious issue. It's just like education. Health care and education need to be seriously looked at by the state of Texas. We need to quit taking a negative perspective and take a positive perspective. Now, does that mean we cave in and do what the federal government says? Absolutely not. But I think from the state of Texas standpoint, the insurance segment, the health policy segment will be seriously considered, re-looked at, yep. viewed. But I think that the exchange issue is something that uh, the governor's taken a strong stance. He's been consistent on that stance. And I think a lot of Texans are consistent on that stance because there's a lot of unknown that's about to happen. Uh, Congressman, the numbers, though, are the numbers. Uh, the Census Bureau in September came out with a report that said that Texas now has 5.8 million uninsured citizens. We have more uninsured citizens as a percentage of our population than any other state. 23% of our population is uninsured. And there are reports out all the time that say that if only Texas would figure out a way to work with the federal government, we could actually get quite a lot of those uninsured Texans on insurance. Do you think that the better course for us to pursue, as Representative Hunter apparently does too, uh, is to not engage the federal government on the Affordable Care Act and go our own way? Well, exit polls so show nationally 65% of the people, despite voting for President Obama, are opposed to the Affordable Care Act. So I think the governor, I, that number I'm sure is higher in Texas. So I think the governor is representing uh, the opinion of the folks in Texas. I think the way we do it in Texas uh, will serve as a model for uh, other states and, uh, and, and potentially uh, the federal government. The, one of the arguments against the federalization of uh, health care was to allow the different states to try different approaches right. and pick and choose from each other and determine uh, which one uh, is, is going to be the best. It's going to be interesting uh, to see how the numbers work uh, on, on the Affordable Care Act uh, when you have a large number of the states, uh, including a very popular state like Texas, uh, not participating. Declining it, to participate, it, right. It, it certainly uh, it throws off some of the CBO numbers. And uh, from a federal standpoint, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Right. I think Texas is doing the right thing going slow, because we still don't have all the regulations out of uh, out of the federal agencies on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So, Congressman, the problem of, of, of Texas having a high percentage of its citizens uninsured is not a Rick Perry problem, to give the governor his due. The problem didn't come up suddenly during his administration. We had a high percentage during George Bush's time as governor and a high percentage, frankly, during Ann Richards' time as governor. If Texas was better off taking care of itself on the health care issue, why have we allowed, as a state, the problem of our uninsured population to be this high to persist for now going on 20 years. If we were able to take care of the problem ourselves, why haven't we done it so far? I, I, you know, I, I think there, there's more of a, a psychological crisis than there is a, an actual crisis. Uh, th there's no one needing health care that's uh, turned away from an emergency room or health care. Obviously, I think there's some, uh, some areas for uh, improvement there. I don't think the federal plan is, uh, is the way to do it, but there are pieces of it uh, that, that are popular and that can be adopted. One of the things that we see working really well in the state of Texas are the community health centers where uh, emergency rooms offload to a, a community health center that can follow up and go with more long-term care than the acute care that uh, the, the, uh, an emergency room can offer. Uh, we find a funding mechanism for this, which I think out of the county hospital districts and even collaborations with uh, hospitals and insurance companies, there's some openings for some creative financing uh, to be able to do those without uh, relying uh, so heavily on tax dollars. 
uh, Representative Congressman Farenthold is not wrong. The emergency rooms exist as an option for people who don't have insurance. They're not going to be turned away. But with yeah. due, due respect to the Congressman and to Governor Romney, who made a similar point during the campaign, treating uninsured people in emergency rooms is the most costly okay. and least efficient delivery of health care that you can possibly have in the system. And ultimately, it impacts negatively the health care that people with insurance have. Right, and, that, and that's the community health centers are one potential solution to that. Tort reform, another, because a lot of times the uh, emergency rooms and hospitals feel obliged to uh, go way beyond what the normal standard of care, care is to avoid right. uh, potential, uh, potential liability. Obviously, the uh, state has made some great strides in that uh, yeah. with, with the tort reform here in Texas. It's something that obviously needs to be looked at on a national level. Well. Representative, the question we often, people in my position, often ask elected officials is, we know what you're against, what are you for? So we know you're against the Affordable Care Act. Tell me what you're for at the state level in terms of health reform that would be preferable to what the Obama administration has proposed. Well, all right, well, Evan, but the first thing I prefer is transparency. The Affordable Care Act was not transparent. Does everybody forget? Was it Christmas Eve, a rust job? Did we forget that? Is that transparency in government? I think the biggest problem with the affordable health care, which is called Obamacare, I think even he embraces that name yeah. now, so yeah. I'm not offending anybody but by saying it. We have, we have hospitals here. We have a sponsor. Were they included? No. Were the doctors included? No. Were the nurses included? No. Were the people included? No. And when you have amendments where Nebraska gets exempted from the taxation, and then today we're finding out you have real estate taxes being placed to pay for this, I'd say the biggest problem is was how it was handled. Okay, so we're going terrible. forward. So what, Representative, so so what do you want to do that, instead? That's where I'm going, Evan. Right. First of all, let's be open in the state of Texas. First thing we need to look at is insurance. Let's take a look at health insurance. Two, you talk about emergency care. Emergency care will be looked at. It will be looked at under the tort reform and the liability laws. Yes, we're for that. Thirdly, you have to take a look at being able to provide care in a metropolitan area versus a South Texas area. So we have to look at population centers versus non-population centers. We need to look at the health insurance side and the policy side within the state. Now, there are certain care that we don't have control of because it goes into the federal government. Yeah. But I think from the policy and the insurance side and the protection side, we can. I'd rather the state of Texas let our doctors and our hospitals perform medical care than to be told how to provide that medical care. I'd rather it not be corporate America, I'd rather it be medical America. Let me, uh, uh, health care is one issue that obviously transcends state federal borders. There's a piece of it that happens out of Congress, a piece of it that happens out of the state legislature. Immigration is another issue. We heard an enormous amount during this last election cycle about immigration, what the appropriate response to the growing uh, uh, percentage of, of our population that is Latino. We have a certain number of folks in this state and in other states who are undocumented. What should we do about this as a country and as a state? And we're likely, it seems, since the election to hear even more about this, a number of Republicans who might not have been interested in uh, comprehensive immigration reform has started to come to the table, uh, Congressman, since, since the election. So again, uh, as on health care, tell me what you think going forward we're likely to be talking about on immigration as it will impact Texas coming out of the federal government. I think immigration reform was a missed opportunity in the last Congress. For the first time, we had several border Republicans. Uh, historically, the border uh, representatives uh, had all been uh, Democrat. So we, we had an opportunity there we missed. I think you're going to see uh, it coming through. Marco Rubio has uh, come up with a plan in the Senate that has a lot of keys. What I think uh, we need to see uh, in immigration reform is it's got to be coupled with securing the border. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a, a situation uh, to deal with the folks that are in the country now. I think E-Verify is an important key. E-Verify is a system uh, where you can go online and enter a name and social security number, comes back, tells you whether or not that person uh, is qualified so to work in So an country. employer would be and, able an to employee, go online and There'd check. be some uh, very strong sanctions there. I think a piece of it is going to be a guest worker program. Uh, I, I think a piece of it is going to be some of the elements uh, of the DREAM Act yeah. that, uh, especially here in South Texas, we see a lot of people that were brought over uh, to this country as infants and toddlers. Uh, and 
we've paid to educate, we've paid to uh, get through high school, and in some instances, college, don't speak a word of Spanish, but uh, aren't US citizens. We're gonna have to come up with a way to deal with that, but I think we're gonna have to come up with a way to deal with that that does not reward the illegal behavior uh, of the parents. For instance, the, those uh, youngsters might be allowed to stay in this country, but their parents wouldn't be on the, uh, who, who brought them over illegally, wouldn't be automatically eligible for some of the preferences uh, that are uh, available to, uh, to, to family members. I mean, there are a lot of things that we can talk about that uh, don't include amnesty, don't include rewarding illegal behavior, but uh, deal with the real needs we have uh, for, especially in the agricultural industry, uh, for workers, uh, deal with the problems that we have with people who are here uh, illegally, but both of their own and uh, not of their own accord. So you, you will be open to having some kind of a substantive it, discussion on this? It, it's something that I wanted to do in the last Congress. We got so uh, wrapped up with uh, financial matters, which are we, we didn't really solve, but uh, hopefully we'll work a little harder this time, yeah. uh, get some... Uh, uh, get some momentum behind it and, and make it happen. I'm actually uh, making, uh, you know, I, I'd like to be involved in that and have uh, asked to be put in a leadership role on that. Well, it'd be foolish for them to set policy on immigration without having a congressman from Texas who represents a, a population that would be so uh, directly impacted right. by what, what, what comes out of it. Now, we often hear representative at the state level, well, although we don't like the federal government particularly, this is an issue in which the federal government necessarily has to be involved. And in fact, the federal government has defaulted on securing our borders. And really, before we do anything, we've got to get the federal piece right. From the legislative perspective, what do you think we should be thinking about on immigration? Well, I think you're right. I think the border doesn't stop at Texas. And so it's more of an international and a federal issue. A lot of times, they ask us to do things on the state, and we really don't have the authority until you come into the state. Uh, I think that what we need to do is probably the state needs to work with the federal government on a very simple solution. And that is, why aren't we enforcing our current immigration and custom rules? What bothers me is I see us pounding on people, and yet, why aren't we promoting people using the system? We have a system. For example, I'll come right out front creating a wall? Didn't Reagan bring down a wall? And here we are creating a wall? You're, What's, you're opposed to the discussion at the federal level of a wall? Absolutely. The, the, the wall is crazy as you go through Big Bend National Park. The issue is vanishing time. In the metropolitan areas where a wall potentially slows people right. down, where you can uh, you get units or uh, border patrol agents or law enforcement to respond, it, it helps. You know, in, in Brownsville, the vanishing time's a matter of seconds. But you get into, you know, Big Bend, so you track somebody crossing the border through uh, aerial surveillance, and it's potentially an hour before they, right. uh, they, they vanish into the general population. Uh, so, re yeah. Representative, you say that the, we have to, the first thing we have to do is enforce the laws. You know that, I'm sure you know, because it's been publicized quite widely, that the Obama administration in the last four years actually has deported more people than the Bush administration did in the, in, in the preceding eight years. So we, we, appear, we appear to be enforcing that aspect of the law. What, what aspects of the law are we not enforcing that we need to be enforcing? Well, there's, let's take South Texas. We have a lot of people that have been in the citizenship process. Uh, it is a very good goal for them. I, I think it's wrong when we slip people in front of them. If they're going to go through three to four years to become a citizen, why are we giving preference to people that aren't following the rules? That's one thing. Again, that's federal. That's not state. Number two, the biggest problem to me on immigration is we keep making it a negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, Texan, uh, Texas and the United States is a positive. We have all our symbols are to bring people here legally. Why aren't we promoting? I think maybe one of the negatives that we created is we've done it ourselves, is we're sending the wrong message rather than the right What message. do you think the message that we're sending is? Well, I think that the, I, let, let me put it this way. I'd rather send the, pro, the positive message, and that is we are the land of the free. We are the state of the free. And please follow the rules and customs yeah. because you should have the right, if you follow the law, to be here. And I think that's what we should be doing rather than being pounded. And I hate to throw it in. I feel the same way about education. Why do we keep making it a negative? It's a positive. Yep. And I think that's where we need to be going in government from a state federal. Let's create an environment that's positive, because if you do, Evan, you will watch 
positive laws and the people get behind it. I heard Representative Farenthold uh, uh, name check the DREAM Act. You know that right before the election, the president uh, exercised what they call prosecutorial discretion in saying that he was going to uh, uh, essentially enforce by fiat or, or put into place by fiat aspects of what we now know as the DREAM Act that were not passed legislatively. I wonder how both of you feel about that. One key aspect of DREAM Act style legislation has been in-state tuition. Some people believe that Rick Perry's presidential campaign was impaled on his support for in-state tuition as articulated in that Tea Party debate in Florida where he was booed. Uh, and I know, Representative, that here in the Texas legislature, there's a move afoot to, to take back in-state tuition, which was passed by your colleagues perhaps 10 or more years ago. On the Senate side, there's a, there seems to be almost a majority announcing their plans to kick that to the curb. So let me ask you to drill down specifically on the DREAM Act stuff. Well, what should the policy be, and what will the policy in Texas be as far as the well, next session? Okay, okay, the first problem is the president enacting the DREAM Act uh, administratively. He couldn't even get that passed to Democrat-controlled Congress and Senate. Back when Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid were in control, he, he, that couldn't, he couldn't get that passed. He got health care. So it, it's, a, it, it's a huge overreach. It's one of my uh, biggest concerns about the Obama administration is his disregard for Congress and his disregard for the court system. You saw it uh, in Fast and Furious where he said, I claim executive privilege. He argued to the court uh, that they didn't have jurisdiction to review it. He argued to the Supreme Court they didn't have jurisdiction to review uh, his health care reform. And you know, people are complaining about the power grab in uh, Egypt. You, you but, but, so, but substantively, I mean, I, I appreciate that you disagree so with the, the president's the, 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 tactics, okay. but, but substantively. Substantively, substantively there, uh, there needs to be uh, something done, and we've done a lot of casework on individual basis for young children that were bought, brought here as babies, uh, and, and very young children, uh, and, and educated in our schools, we spent we, we spent the money on them. Maybe not get them on a path to citizenship, but do we send them back to Mexico after we or wherever uh, after we've spent all this money to uh, to educate them? It doesn't seem like a reasonable use of uh, of resources. But you also can't give. Uh, it's not fair uh, to bring their parents uh, in as preference people after they uh, they come and their parents broke uh, the law. So. The problem with the DREAM Act is it goes too far, the age limit, I think, uh, is too high, and it gives too much discretion uh, to bureaucrats. Right. Will, you, uh, will you vote to overturn this day tuition if it comes up in the House, well, Representative? I can't tell you yes or no till I see it, as you see how it comes in the legislature, goes, starts at an A and comes to a Z. But here's what I want to tell you on that, on tuition. I think after this election, Nueces to Hidalgo, I am the only Anglo state official left. The population in this state is going to boom in South Texas. If we're going to talk tuition, it'd be nice that it be involving the different regions. South Texas needs to have an input in it. It cannot be dictated by other regions of the state. So on the tuition, it's hard to tell you today, since we haven't really seen what bill is going to come out, but I do hope whatever we do, they involve the regions, Evan. And I think our region has been overlooked through uh, many years, and I hope that it is uh, all-encompassing so that certain regions aren't telling us how to be in their way. So we'll see, but I'm open to watch everything. Uh, I've heard a lot about uh, money that we have to spend, whether it's health care, tuition dollars, what have you today. There's a big debate on right now nationally, and especially in Texas, that the governor uh, uh, has, has taken an active role in, in saying that we don't have a revenue problem. I suspect that it's not only at the state level, but at the federal level. We have a spending problem. That is often the way that you hear the budget issues in this country and in the state described. The counter view to that is that we don't have a spending problem. We have a failure to invest in the future of Texas or of the country problem. Can each of you talk about that? Because, you know, good people of unlike mind can see these budget issues very differently. But we do know that we have a limited number of dollars, and the question is what we're going to spend them on. Congressman, what do you, what do you think our priorities on the budget should be? Well, uh, another way of putting what, uh, what you said, if we don't have a taxing problem, we have a spending problem, is uh, if we take more money uh, from you guys uh, and, and bring it up to Washington, do you think we're going to spend it wisely? And I think universally you're uh, going to get uh, 
a no answer to that. Um, the problem, and it, the, the same is true in government you know, and in business. What do, you, what do you focus on? Do you focus on the bottom line today? Or do you focus on the bottom line uh, 10 years from now? And that's, uh, that's what board of directors of corporations are there for. And that's what uh, Congress is there for. I think it's a really healthy form uh, of, of debate and is a way we need to be looking at things. I, I found in my uh, almost two years in Congress uh, that for the most part, we tend to be more concerned with what's going to be on the news tonight and not what's going to be on so, the news. So you have a longer term tonight. view of the health of this country and you're concerned about the rising federal deficit. Right. Uh, we're not going you know, to be able to pay the current bill. So you're focused on cutting spending more than on anything else, whatever willingness right. you have to consider revenues. H have you signed the Go Grover and Norquist anti-tax pledge, Congressman? I signed it when I ran in, uh, in 2010. Right. I, 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 I did not re-sign it uh, this time. Do you, consider it to still was, be, do you consider it to still be operable? Uh, I, think feel, I think an intervening pledged, election, I, uh, I, I think it's a, you've got a reasonable argument you've had an in intervening election and you could wiggle out of it. But I campaigned this time on not raising taxes. I have no intention of raising taxes. So are, are, you, are you going to wiggle out of it or not? I don't intend to. So the, the Senator Chambliss from Georgia, no one's idea of a liberal. Uh, Senator Graham of South Carolina, mostly no now, one's now, idea now of a liberal. Now, Grover and I may right. uh, disagree These guys have all said they're going to wiggle out of it. Now, the, may disagree on, uh, yeah. on what is a tax increase. I clearly think a increase in the percentage of taxes that a person is charged is a tax increase. Closing loopholes? But is closing loopholes uh, right. a tax increase? Right. And uh, I, I, I don't think it, I, I'm not sure, I, actually I'm sure closing, uh, closing loopholes loophole is not a tax okay. increase. Uh, Representative Governor Perry uh, put a budget compact in front of the legislature, didn't make anybody sign it, but a lot of people who wanted to be identified as quite conservative rushed to sign pledged no new taxes, no increases on existing taxes, no accounting tricks. There's some dispute about fees, but you understand what I'm asking. Are you pledged not to raise taxes in the next session? Yeah, I'm not going to raise taxes. I think you've got a taxing problem. I think you've got a spending problem. I think that uh, we're not going to raise taxes. I think that you do have this issue. It's an allocation and revenue. Why aren't we promoting more revenue? I've done the cruise ships. Why are we not getting statewide backing? That brings revenue. Allocation. We have higher education, public education. You have money. Why is it being promoted into higher and public education? It's the shifting. It's the appropriations. I th margins tax. We have a small businesses out here. That's a punishment tax for people who are having to pay money to go into the budget. And it's underperforming on revenue. It's right? underperforming. So I think you've got a taxing and a spending issue in this state. I think the issue is, as we grow and we get more money, it's appropriations, it's funding, it's allocation. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm biased on this, I think that we need to look at education, Evan, because your best economic indicator, your best economic performer, and the best expertise is putting your money in public and higher education. And you know what? I think if we allocate to those areas, you'll see more spending and tax relief in the state of Texas. You, you were a vote, uh, as I, uh, I, I'm, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm a guess that you were a vote to support the, the state budget last time, which included a historic cut on, on public education. Yes. I, I'm assuming you did that reluctantly based on what you're saying. Well, no, I, I don't have a problem with the budget. I have a problem on where you allocate. So, so you would not, if you ruled the world, you would not have cut four and a half billion dollars from public ed in Texas? I'm not, well, if I ruled the world, would I get to pick where I cut? The answer is yes. So then, okay, so well, but you're not answering me. Would you, would you have no, cut, I, you did know, you want to cut four and a half billion? Should we have punished education? The answer is no. So will you be voting this session with whatever dollars were available to reinstate some of those public education Absolutely. Cuts? I'll be supporting education from the higher and the public ed, and I'm going to do everything I can to help South Texas, because I think we have been cut more than other areas of the state. And I think it's time we get some folks to stand up and support our region. Let me ask you one last question before we open it up to the audience here. And that's about the general toxicity of politics. You know, again, the partisanship and the divisiveness of this country is not an Obama deal or a Bush deal. It goes back to Clinton and maybe even goes back before that. My memory gets a little foggy before Clinton. Uh, but the fact is the country is quite divided. 
Um, uh, Representative, you're going back into a body in which the toxicity of politics was a constant talking point and theme mm -hmm. during the last Congress. And again, since we're returning a Democratic president, a Republican-led House, and a Democratic-led Senate, again, as you said, definition of insanity, I think we can expect probably quite a bit of that toxicity in the next session. Um, address that at the federal level, and I want to ask Representative Hunter about where we are on, in terms of divisiveness at the state level. You know, I, I think there is a, a level of divisiveness. I don't think it goes uh, to a personal level to the degree I think some people uh, would think. I consider a, a good many of my Democrat colleagues to be friends. But I do think we are debating some of the fundamental issues uh, that face uh, this country that are the fundamental differences between uh, Republicans and Democrats. So, uh, you know, it's, you, you're going to see some division just because I think there are two different visions for the future of this country. When I got there, uh, I, I used to think everybody uh, wants what's best for the country. There are just different ways to get there. Now I believe that there are actually two different visions for what's best for the country. And that's harder to compromise on when your vision for the country is different. But you can respect the people who just disagree with you on how to get there. You accept the fact that the people who don't see the world you do want the best country they could possibly have. Right, but I, and, and again, I, I just do think to some degree there's a difference. One of the, one of the turning points for me was when I heard, was talking to some Democrats, and they indicated that their metric for success is the number of people they're helping on social programs. To me, that's a metric of failure, the number of people who need to be on a social program. And so it, it's a fundamental different vision for the country. The Republicans and I believe in helping, helping yourself and, and helping each other, while the Democrats see as a measure of success the number of people that are relying on the government. Representative, you were a Democrat once. I alluded to that. I hope you don't hate me for reminding people of that. <laughs> Uh, in a state now that is quite Republican, in fact, the Democratic Party is in some respects the third party in a two-party state at the moment, uh, where the moderate Republicans and the Tea Party Republicans are really where all the action is. I, I wonder if you would talk about the, the atmosphere in the Capitol politically right now. How divided is it, and is there a way for people to come to some accommodation, or is it going to be another session of the two sides warring with one another? I think this is going to be a session of regions. Uh, some of the regions are, you know, more populated with one party than another. But I think that, yes, there's going to be some partisanship. You're going to have that in this, this next session because of the numbers. But I also think when you look at our region, and I think certain other regions, you're going to see a lot of working together. Texas were great during the campaigns, and uh, you and the Tribune and all the news make all that money off those campaign commercials. and. And they we don't, all we, that we don't take any campaign oh, okay. but that's okay. But the Maybe point, we should have. Actually. The point is, is that once the, the session starts, Texas, uh, the legislature, much different than Washington, works pretty much together. You're going to have other folks that have their issues, but you know what? We really work pretty well together. My focus, again, is going to be strengthening and really helping South Texas. I think it's not as much going to be partisan, Evan. I think it's going to be regional. And uh, there's going to be some issues that are, are going to pit sometimes the parties. But you know what? In the end, I think a lot is made of partisanship in the state of Texas when it's really the area that you live in. All right, well, let's leave it there for the time being. Very grateful to these two for coming and sitting before us and answering these tough questions. Please give a hand to Congressman Farenthold, Representative Hunter.